now that we got all the crap out of the way that was the worst of the year, now we can talk about the stuff that, uh, actually matters. <laughs> and the thing is, is, um, there, usually when you come out of most years, there'll be most people saying, like, oh, this was such a bad year for movies, or this is one of the worst years of movies since ever, or whatever the hell they say. And I think, especially looking at this list, um, 2019 was a pretty decent year uh, overall, and they were all kind of scattered throughout the year also. So uh, I was pretty pleased overall with how like just the year as a whole turned out, because you know so many years have like all years have their shitty movies you know sprinkled throughout, and there's a lot of them. Uh, but we had a lot of really great stuff here also. The only real complaint I have about what I'm looking at. <laughs> is, um, this is another case, this is like the third year in a row now, where when we used to do this, there were often times where I'd have, like, some, maybe like an indie movie, or maybe like a movie that was kind of off the radar, and something I was hoping to, you know, like, draw attention to, uh, by mentioning and acknowledging, and for the past few years, when I do this, it's been mostly pretty... Like, there's not really much stuff off the radar. It's like the like the best stuff that comes out uh, year after year now is getting like more and more noticed uh, as it goes on. So, yeah, unfortunately, there's not really going to be anything here that's like a an out of nowhere choice or like a surprise choice or anything like that. Because I mean, I I would want to make it interesting, and maybe throw in some stuff like that, but then it would just be disingenuous, and then there would be no point. So. <laughs> Um, I, so I tried to actually legitimately go with the ones that I really felt something about, uh, in one way or another. Um, the only one that I was, I was trying to figure out if I was even going to put it here or, at all, which I didn't, but it would have been probably just barely bumped out anyway, was, um, El Camino. Uh, because I'm not quite sure about the whole, you know, TV movie and stuff like that, and if it, you know, I mean, I know it's just me doing this so I can say whether it's eligible or whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, but, um, yeah, I was, I was really, really pleased with, uh, the Breaking Bad movie that Netflix put out, to the point that I probably consider it, uh, one of the best of the year, and I was actually going to consider putting it here, but the one I have in the honorable mention spot, like, just bumped it out, so, uh, to throw that out there, and there are, there are quite a few things also that were, like, because usually it's kind of a hassle to put this together, because it's like, by the time you get to seven, you're like, oh, then what's, you know, good enough for the last three, um, but there was a lot of stuff, like, I was overflowing and had to cut stuff down. That's how much, that's how much there was this year that I really, really liked that much. So, uh, this is just the result of that. So, um, and once again, if there's something that, you know, you're looking for, just remember that no list on the internet or YouTube or anything like that is going to somehow devalue how you feel about a certain movie, so I'm not even sure which movies this year that would be that aren't here, but if that's the case, um, just, just worry about yourself, this is just, <laughs> this is just, um, me getting this out there, and if you agree, then that's fantastic. So, um, I guess we're gonna start with an honorable mention, uh, as is the tradition. Uh, the honorable mention is gonna be Midsommar. Um, who, which is from the director whose last movie also uh, made this list for me last year, which was Hereditary. Um, and Ari Aster is obviously, much like another series of, a series of names out there, is really making this big impact in the horror genre in this really big way, and almost kind of starting this, like, sort of separate wave of these, these movies that are, like horror movies that are, like, reaching critical acclaim now. Uh, it's, like, really become a thing in, like, the past four years or so in this sort of... I struggle to say indie vein, but in that sort of... not quite... because they're getting mainstream releases, but they're not quite as on the radar as, like, your sort of standard horror movies. Uh, and they're trying to do uh, a lot of different things with it, but still taking, you know, inspiration from other stuff. Obviously, there's a lot of The Wicker Man in Midsummer, but, I mean, when you look at just his style and the fact that it's a terrifying movie that's mostly set in the very bright daylight and this incredible Florence Pugh performance. Between Florence Pugh and this and Tony Collette and Hereditary, it's also like big, you know, award-worthy performance that's coming out of horror movies has really uh, been something that's coming out of this sort of new wave of them also. And it's, uh, yeah, 
And I, I mean, struggle to say, you know, new wave thing, because it is... You know, it's it, there's been merit in a lot of horror movies uh, all throughout the years and decades, but just seeing this kind of nice, refreshing new set of them, and it seems like there's at least uh, a couple a year, and this one, I would say, um, really stood out in a big way. And even, even if, you know, he's... It might seem overblown that it's nearly two and a half hours, but, I mean, between the dynamic of the characters with um, Florence Pugh and Jack Rayner and William Jackson Harper and Will Poulter and the kind of things going on between them and how that's their emotion between the, the four of them and what's going on between them is driving what is inevitably the horror that we come to. And in the way, just the way they channel stuff like that, where like all the elements of the movie are working towards the horror of it um, is really great. Like it's no, even if it seems like they're sidestepping to do something else, it's going to come back in some horrific way uh, and have this really great impact. And like I said, his movies are extremely well made and well shot, and just everything uh, comes together to get to get his. F we feel like we're getting his full artistic vision, which is really um, rewarding, also. So, yeah, that's just in a nutshell how I felt about Midsummer, and uh, just this sort of where horror movies are at now in general. Um, if you just sidestep the main, the not mainstream, but the the shitty mainstream ones, we'll say. Um, so, number 10 is going to be Jojo Rabbit, and Jojo Rabbit is a movie that I didn't think I was going to love this much until, and I'll try to refrain from saying too much, because I don't know how many people still haven't seen it, but this is a movie that I wasn't sure if I was going to love this much until, like, the second half happens, or the, la the last third or so happens, uh, and this movie really shows, um, just how much it's, it's something special and kind of unexpected. Because you've got Taika Waititi, who adapted it and directed it, and he's obviously known for his comedic style with stuff like What We Do in the Shadows and Thor Ragnarok and stuff like that. Um, and this, this very distinct comedic style, and it's very, very over-the-top and very sort of outlandish. Um, there is, it's one of those cases where you just say the concept of the movie and you think, like, you know, you're allowed to make stuff like that. But the way in which he does it, you can tell just how he was able to work with this material and get not just the product itself, but the reaction it's gotten as well out of it. And the way, the very careful way in which he handles uh, what, taking when he's taking the comedic approach, and then when it's just going to punch you in the gut when you least expect it. And it's able to do both those things. Because when it's being a comedy, it is like way over the top. There's a lot of Wes Anderson comparisons, and it's like you got to take Wes Anderson and then, like, really crank it up to some really over-the-top levels, and you see what the comedy is going on here. And you get stuff like what uh, Rockwell and Alfie, Alfie Allen and Rebel Wilson are doing. Stephen Merchant has a really great scene, uh, probably the funniest scene in the movie. And then it's right around then um, that it's... This movie is over-the-top and hilarious and sort of fantastical, until it's not and it's like even when it reaches that breaking point and you're like you're like really faced with the true horrors of the setting at least as much as this movie can show there is there's still comedic elements in there to where it's not entirely trying to ditch its identity which is what a lot of movies that take this approach that's the problem that they have is they it seems like they're one thing and they stick to that one thing and then when they suddenly want to be something else they just they try to pretend they weren't that thing before and this movie embraces all the elements it's got going on because there's still because it's it's does like the exact reverse where it's the really over the top comedy and those dark moments like kind of peek themselves in occasionally and kind of set that tone and it's not completely without provocation and warning that the second half happens. But when we do get to that second half, it's that reverse where it's like, we kind of start to get surrounded by the darkness and the horror of the situation with the comedy being the thing that's peeking in and out. Um, and there's like, there's just something so, like the precision in which he handled that. And the way some of these things are, it's like, you would think in a different context this may not be the way to go, but the way he like, the, I mean, it's a gut punch, but at the same time, the way certain things are revealed about the horror of it is, it's the sensitivity that he handles it with, uh, where it's like that trans, the transition is like 
like it's it's it punches us in the gut, but it's like loving about it. Uh, it's like it's like a tough love sort of thing. Is what the vibe I kind of get from it is. So, um, and that's and that goes like a long way. Like I said, if if it wasn't for the second half of this movie, I don't think I would think this highly of it. But that second half just works so well and hits so hard, and it makes you see the first half, you know, in another way entirely. Um, and it's, and, and yeah, just the, it's, I, I have no idea how he managed to do that tonally, but, uh, that, that really goes a long way, so I did really love that in the long run. Obviously the performances are incredible. Scarlett Johansson, and it is one of my favorite performances of the year, so that, all of that, uh, takes it to those levels also, so, yes. Uh, my number nine is probably the most off the radar of these, even though it's really not off the radar is, uh, it's the Peanut Butter Falcon. And this is a movie that kind of just sort of snuck in here, because it's like, what's really great about this movie is it seems absolutely 100% like it is just a giant bag of cliches. And it's like, it's it's an inspirational story, you've got the unlikely duo, you've got the, the romance that blossoms for whatever reason, um, and all these different things, and obviously the lead character, Zach, um, who is also the first name of the actor that plays him, it has Down Syndrome, and so you would think that that sort of, there'd be almost something like, this is going to be one of those manipulative movies, um, but they're so, first off, the golden thing about the casting of him was that it wasn't just some, um, well, just sort of, like a lot of indie movies do, especially with this sort of setting, is they just sort of pull people off the street. Um, but I actually thought it was a great decision to not only get an actor that actually has Down syndrome, but the fact that this is a guy that actually, before they cast him in the movie, was already studying acting. So it was like, it, there, it didn't feel particularly like gimmicky the way it would um, with another production. And then, the, obviously, the chemistry between him and Shia is just gonna, real, is really the core of the movie. And then you've got all kinds of interesting side characters. A lot of familiar faces like Thomas Hayden Church and Bruce Dern and John Bernthal, and then recognizable faces in wrestling like Mick Foley and uh, Jake Roberts. And the thing about that also is that the the fact that he is so driven by a goal, this main character, and the fact that he will do pretty much anything uh, to get to that goal, and Shia will pretty much do anything to help him get there. Um, and there's the whole sort of sweet relationship between them, and just really shows off the heart of the movie. But in another movie, this is the thing, this is the thing where like I was talking about it's a bag of cliches. But the the great thing about this movie is that inst like it's actually to a point now to where it's almost overdone to try to subvert cliches to where like the movie is refreshing in the sense that it has all the cliches here but it's the way in which it embraces the cliches where it's like they they're not trying to run away from them it's just they have they decide well yes we have reached this trope but how are we going to do that and still make it effective is the way it seems they went into it and like every note sort of hits like every emotional beat and all that stuff it just ends up working uh because of the way they handle it rather than trying to run away from it um which and like I said, I'm just as, you know, anti-cliché as anybody else, but it's like, the fact that they were able to just go for it and still do their own thing with it, I think is just as admirable as if they had found something else to do with it entirely. Um, because this is the kind of movie where you know where it's going to end up, it's just a matter of how it gets there, but the reason that works is because we know and love the characters enough by this point in the movie that we want them to get there. Like, that's the thing. It's not... It, you kind of stop with the whole, hey, surprise me, and you're just like, you know, please do that thing that I think is going to happen. Um, and it's great. And it doesn't take any of that time to, like, you know... There are those moments in movies where they have... The, mo the moments where, like, everybody gets sad, or there's, like, an obstacle they can't get past, and it's like, oh, no, we've been beat, and then there's the triumphant moment. Now this, if this, when this movie wallows, it's like for maybe 20 seconds, and it's like, it does that just enough to get that emotion in, and then it's ready to move on, and then go do the other thing. Like, it, does, it doesn't just screw around with itself, and, and I really, really love that, and it's like, and it's, it's like, it feels like it's in tune with us, the viewer, because it's like, 
just like usually there are movie the movies are basically trying to catch up with us where like something happens and a character g sees a setback and then we as the audience just have to wait for the movie to catch up to us because we know where it's going to end up but it's like just when we are ready to move on the movie does from whatever is going on or for whatever has stopped it at this point and that was just so like the whole thing just feels so refreshing while at the same time being a more or less familiar story at its core and that was just that was just so incredibly appealing to me pretty much through the whole thing so uh, I really can't recommend that enough and really love that so number eight is going to be Parasite probably one of the probably the most universally beloved movie of the year I would say that's probably safe to say um, I don't know that I've heard of any detractors of it yet and obviously it's doing very well in the awards race and what's so interesting about that is that this is another movie that is so refreshing in the sense of when I say it, had, like, if I had seen this around the time, like, if I had been there at Cannes when, like, everybody was seeing it for the first time, it would have been absolutely shocking to me to be able to say now I haven't heard of any detractors of it. I'm sure they're out there, absolutely, because all movies do, even the most perfect ones. Um, but I haven't really seen anything particularly negative thrown at this movie by anybody uh, that I've come in contact with or seen or read or whatever. And what's so interesting about that, the reason I find that so shocking is it's like, this is a movie <laughs> where it feels like we're all, like, universally, like, all moviegoers from all around were able to gather together and see Parasite and just agree that something was so gloriously fucked up <laughs> but in like the best most sadistic way possible and that's the reason we all love it <laughs> is so is so out there um and the way it tells this story and the way it goes from one thing to the other and how it's like i talked about the greatness of the peanut butter falcon was the predictability and the fact that we wanted it to get to that and now we've got Parasite, which I didn't mean to pair these together because it's kind of the perfect contrast. Parasite is that perfect movie where you have no idea what the fuck is going to happen. <laughs> it's like, you, it sets it and it's like, it sets you in one path and you're like, oh, I see, this is the direction we're going to go. And you're okay with that. It's like, yes, this is a really intriguing story. And these characters are like so sort of offbeat and like unpredictable. Like you want to see what exactly they're going to do, and there's sometimes where you can't always read them, like, you kind of get a sense of them, but you're still not quite sure of what all they're capable of, and then just when you get used to that, there's a different path, and then there's a different path again, and then it just kind of keeps going in that direction, in those various directions, and... and, and yeah, in the way that it gets, it's so easy to see, because there is that barrier that Bong Joon-ho himself, the director, was talking about at the Golden Globes, um, where people seem to have so much of a problem of seeing a movie that's subtitled. And it's so clear, watching this movie, how it became so universal, and how because it's just so, in, it's so mesmerizing and engrossing. And like I said, in sort of that, you know, in almost a perverse way, because it's like, how, what other line is this going to cross, and what other, you know, possible fucked up direction is it going to go in, and it always finds another one, <laughs> um, and it's really, it kind of feels like, unlike anything you've seen, it's, once again, it's not always movies that you can probably compare it loosely to other movies as far as, like, the themes go, like, the themes have been, in the movie have been explored a number of times, like, mainly with the classes and stuff like that, but it's it's the execution <laughs> and the way the characters interact with each other. And like I said, you're not really sure what move the story is going to make next and what move one of the individual characters is going to make next. Any of them. And so, and you don't know who's capable of whatever. And it's like, it's always this thing where you don't quite know what's around the corner. And the great thing about that is that it is not the movie's sole strength. Because you can go back to it again and it's, you can still see, even when you know every aspect and every in and out of it, it's like, there are ways the pieces of the puzzle were falling together before you even realized it. And it's like, you can go back and see all of that happen all over again. And so I think that, 
is what's really like. I, I mean, I, I'm so excited when I say this and talk about it. But even so, I don't think I'm near as passionate as most people about it, is the crazy thing um, about being this excited about talking about it. Whereas, like, I, it is one of those movies where I feel like I admire it and just its craft in general more than, you know, I do seeing it as, like, an entertaining movie from beginning to end, the way most people do. Um, but still, I mean, there's, there's so much... Uh, to admire here about what they've done here. And, the, and I, the only reason I think I say that is because it probably seems very low on this list. Um, but that, that's the reason. I'm, I'm just kind of more, like, passionate emotionally and otherwise about um, the seven on top of it. But this is definitely something to be admired, and it's totally this really refreshing and fun choice for the what seems to be the most beloved movie of the year. So... Um, so yes, that's that's amazing. <laughs> um, number seven is Four vs. Ferrari, a movie that I absolutely, by no means, was expecting to love this much. Um, because the sports movie, for the most part, even though I'm not a sports person at all, um, there is the sports movie does have a way of like bringing you in and getting you invested in its characters and the sport itself, even if that's not really your thing. But this movie is feels like kind of a... I mean, it's the same thing, but it's also kind of a different thing. For, the first thing I was really impressed with was how it was able to... Once again, another movie that I feel like was made easily universal because it doesn't get too into the mechanics of the sport itself. Because uh, obviously there's a lot of dialogue about that in regards to them like building the car, but not enough that it would alienate anybody that's, that that's kind of foreign language to. Um... Because there's so much more going on here. There is the... Just sort of the competitiveness in general. The word versus is literally in the title. <laughs> um, and the fact that we see everybody from such a human angle where, like... Like, uh, one thing that really stands out in the movie, the more I think about it, is um, Tracy Lutz's performance as Ford and what they did with the character, where it's... the the Like, he starts off seeming like, you know... The big, head, <clears throat> the big head, like, company, corporate dude, and he's the one that's yelling at the employees and saying, you know, he's displeased with the product and we need to be better than Ferrari and stuff like that. And then the the way we get to see him throughout the movie and the, the human elements of him where we see him get, like, actually emotionally damaged by the things that Ferrari said and seeing that that's what drives him. And then the great scene when uh, Shelby takes him for the ride and then we see him break down and he says... Like, this car and everything that you're doing is... I wish my father was here for this. And that that's really a big portion of the movie's heart. Um, and not even taking into account everything that's going on with Bale, with not just the family life, but the way we really fall into... Because he could have been the cliché guy of he's, you know, neglecting the family and he's too involved in the race thing, but there's so many back-and-forth scenes between, like, him and his wife and then him and his son um, that, like, everything when it gets to the actual racing scenes, all the emotional impact from those scenes has carried over into the race scenes and made them more intense and suspenseful than they ever would have been in a movie that didn't bother with that character stuff. And uh, so th these performances in particular, like Bale, like the scene when he's out with his son on the runway, and then this, this, is, this is what I'm talking about too, talking about all these individual scenes, particularly the Bale family scenes, is that or the scene with, you know, Shelby taking Ford out, is, it's, it was crazy to me how much, like, every single individual scene, one right after the other, um, felt like its own individual great moment. And it's like, it's, it's one thing when you have scenes that just kind of build and then there's one payoff, but it's like, it's like, there's a long portion in the middle where, like, every individual scene, one right after the other, has its own big payoff. And then it's the whole thing itself has the ultimate payoff of everything that happens at the race. And it's, like, the whole, just everything all added up together um, just really makes it something great. This is, one, this is one of the movies I ended up seeing twice in the theater. And it's, like, a month apart. And when I went, like, a month later after it had come out, there were still a lot of people in there, and that was really satisfying. Um, and it does really just feel like one of those sort of classic... Cloud pre cla oh, Jesus crowd pleaser movies, despite not 
always having, you know, not always ending in triumph. And that's... And I, I always love a sports movie that can do that also, where it's like, it's not even necessarily about the triumph of all that. And even when it gets to that point, when, like, you know, Josh Lucas has gotten in Ford's head and said, this is how the race should end. And it's like, that's... There's, we still understand because of all that previous stuff where Ford is coming from. And it's like, it all, where like, if it's, you know, emotionally devastating for one character, we get why another character would want that. And it's all, and it's like, it doesn't even have to be the main character that completely gets the full triumph and payoff here. And so it's like, the way it's like, you know, compromises like that, and this is. Obviously, a much poorer movie would have ch tried to change history to make it as, you know, inspirational as possible. Um, but obviously, this is a movie that's better than, you know, do <laughs> than something like that. Um, so, that's, um, yeah, I don't really know what else I can say about it uh, that I didn't already uh, earlier, back in November. So, yes, um, I really, really love Forrest Ferrari as well. Um, six is going to be Avengers Endgame. Uh, this was inevitable because I have been a huge fan of the MCU since the very start of it, uh, when Iron Man came out in May of 2008, uh, May 2nd, I want to say. Um, and there is, the thing, the thing about this movie is that, yeah, there is some stuff that, like, you know, when you see a movie like this for the first time, and it is, like, the ultimate event. Like, this is, like, this is the reason I don't fault Scorsese for saying what he said about, you know, superhero movies, about them being, like, theme parks, because it's like, even if he meant it in a slightly derogatory way, but not entirely, um, where he was trying to say it wasn't his thing as well. But the thing is, is that I do think there's some merit in that, because, yeah, um, a movie like this really is just kind of an experienced thing. Like, you go to a theater, and you've got, like, the whole crowd there, everybody that's been on the same journey. It's like, it was like, you know, seeing Deathly Hallows 2 in a theater with all the fans, that, it like, this has been you know, their whole, they had followed this for, like, the entire decade, and it's the same amount of time with this. It was, you know, the decade, actually 11 years now. Um, but it, it is just that whole shared experience, and, and yeah, you see those big moments. Like, I, I obviously, we're past spoiler territory, right? <laughs> uh, you see the moments, like, um, Cap getting, you know, Thor's hammer, um, Thanos' guns turning to the sky, and it's Captain Marvel coming into the atmosphere, and the everybody coming back, the big thing, you know, Chris Evans saying Avengers Assemble, um, all this stuff, there are those moments where you see that for the first time, and it's, it's this experience that can't be replicated under any circumstance. And so, it's especially a first-time viewing thing and a crowd experience thing. Those absolutely still can hit uh, when you revisit, but maybe not to the extent that it was that first time, that event time, when it was a shared experience and you were seeing it for the first time and all that. So that may be what brings this movie down in the long run, is that there's really nothing like the first time. It's like, because most of these movies we're talking about, like Parasite, where you can probably just go back to again and again regardless of how much you know. Um, and movie being about, you know, the unexpected or whatever. Um, this is, there's still just the whole, like, this sort of, I, I was wondering the whole time what I was even going to do with Endgame when it came to making an end-of-the-year list, because it's like, because it, it's followed by, like, 21 or 22 movies. And so it's like, it's this, this whole unprecedented thing, and it's like, it really just kind of feels like it transcends the whole top ten idea. Um, so it's like, is there even really a place you can put that? And is it even, you know, not that this is a huge deal or anything, it's a fucking list, but um, but is it fair to, like, other things that a movie that had 21 other movies to get it to this point, where most a lot of these are, like, standalone, um, like, would I even put it on here at all? Um, but it's like... Yeah, and then there's really just, like I said, the emotional factor. Things, like, that other movies won't have, where it's, like, in particular, there is, once again, we're long past spoiler territory, I imagine. Um, <clears throat> seeing the death of Tony Stark after 11 years of movies is, I remember 
when I mean people always say that he's basically the character and the character is basically him, but I mean it was weird. When I came back from Endgame after seeing it the first time, I felt like Robert Downey Jr. had died. Like it, it felt like a real person had died. It was really weird and like really, it just kind of it just this heaviness that I like held for the rest of the day. Um, and it's like I almost I almost didn't want to go back and watch the other movies for a while because it just would have felt weird. You know, it would have felt like you were watching like a montage at a funeral. <laughs> um, and that funeral scene itself is just just absolute. Just having all those people in the same shot with no trick editing, all of them in the same place for this big emotional send-off is like, you just don't feel that <laughs> um, very often at all. And the, th and the I guess the personal thing to take away from it, um, which is this movie's advantage, is that the way, talking about carrying the death of Tony Stark, like, yeah, he's a fictional character, obviously. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. is just fine. Fucking Doolittle comes out next week. <laughs> but the thing about it was there is something about those. And some, and some I, obviously, you know, with certain fan bases, there'll be people that really connect to something and there'll be other people that, you know, think it's, you know, pathetic to latch onto something so fictional. But people are going to have those individual connections to to stories in some sense or another, whichever stories they may be. And the thing that I didn't think about until long after seeing Endgame the first time was um, how much a personal impact the Tony Stark character had on me. And what I was thinking about was I, in April, at the end of April in 2008, um, I had a friend that died, which is something that had never, that kind of thing had never happened to me before. And it was this really bizarre sort of life-altering thing and then it was like a couple weeks later that the first Iron Man came out and so like that movie was there and we saw that and then a couple years later uh, I was in love for the first time and regardless of how I feel about that person now which isn't much uh, <laughs> one of the movies that I saw with her in that time was Iron Man 2 and regardless of how I feel about that person now that memory and how I feel, how I felt at that time is attached to that movie now. It just is. And then when I started doing this whole review thing, um, which has been a much longer portion of my life than I ever would have expected, regardless of it just being this, just this, you know, low effort sort of thing. Um, but it's been like seven years almost, and the first movie I ever reviewed on camera was Iron Man 3. <laughs> and then you go forward a little bit, and um, in 2016, um, the dog that I had all throughout my childhood, um, we lost him right about then, and then it was very not long after that, we were still kind of dealing with that, that Civil War came out. And then the following year, uh, we lost my grandma which was still, like, it, it, that it, That was a few years ago. That's still weighing heavily on this family, like, the whole family. Um, and while we were still, like, right there in that grieving process, Spider-Man Homecoming came out. And I started looking back on it, and it was, like, all of these, like, life-changing things and life-defining things in my life, a Tony Stark movie was there. <laughs> and it's, like, the next thing that happens in my life that is life-defining, Tony Stark is going to be dead. And a Tony Stark movie is not going to be there. And it was like, that was... And I said, he's a fictional character, and that shouldn't have the impact that it does. <laughs> but it's... Thinking about it in that sense also, it was just like, you know... It was like, it felt like this magnificent loss. <laughs> um, and that's... And stories can just eventually... Can find that impact if the context is right. And sometimes that just happens, especially if it's in those times in your own personal life. Fictional stories can have some impact like that. Um, and this series has really shown that, especially with this character. And it's... Uh, and I didn't mention, like, Age of Ultron or Infinity War, and it's, like, really just as a lifelong movie lover, just seeing event movies like that is was a really cool thing to have witnessed. Um, so... Yeah, so like I said, it's really more... There's probably more outside forces than anything else playing a part in people's love uh, for this movie, but for some people, it's just there. So that's 
pretty much probably the best I can say about that anyway that obviously hasn't been said before. So we'll move on to the top five now. And my number five is another gloriously fucked up movie called The Lighthouse. <laughs> um, I got It got its home media release this, this past Tuesday, and I got to see it again. And I was so happy that I did. And <laughs> Because the great thing is, I was talking about Ari Aster, who did Hereditary in Midsummer, and how he's one of these names that's going to be huge in the horror world. He pretty much already is after two movies. Um, and you can say the same exact thing about Robert Eggers. Um, with this movie following up The Witch. And this is... I, I'm not even quite sure how, <clears throat> how to describe what all about this movie, like, why it works. <laughs> but uh, uh, the main... The center of it, obviously, has got to be the performances from Pattinson and Defoe. Particularly Defoe. Um, who is... Like, Defoe is, like, this absolute... Always been fearless actor. And Pattinson is definitely going down that road as well. Um, like I said, yeah, he's yeah he's gonna be playing Batman for a little bit, but I mean, you know he's gonna be doing this shit in between uh, for sure, <laughs> um, because he because he's just attracted to interesting projects like that. But this whole idea, this is another one where it might seem, on paper, like it's gimmicky, where you you change up the you got the classic aspect ratio, you got the black and white that makes it look like it was made in like the 30s or something, but all the elements are just working towards this, whether it be the way it's shot. The sound in this movie is spectacular. I said with like the sinister sound of the waves and the seagulls in the background being a lot of the soundtrack. Um, it's all oh, that just everything about it is like like there's there's things like towards the beginning where we say they're tone setting, but there are tone setting things and events and details throughout this movie from beginning to end. And it's it's another one of those cases where you just don't know what fucking insane thing is going to happen next, what fucking insane thing Willem Dafoe is going to do, or what next insane fucking thing Pattinson is going to see that may or may not be a vision or a nightmare or whatever the hell it is. And the thing about that is this is one of those movies where I talked about this a lot when we talked about The Shining in the past, the multiple times we talked about The Shining in the past, where it's, there's going to be so many interpretations of this movie because it's so... It just really leaves itself so abstract enough and open to that kind of thing. Um, but I feel like I want to treat this movie the way I treat The Shining, where it's like, yeah, you can look at it and you can say, oh, this thing is symbolic towards this thing, or, oh, this thing, you know, means this thing, or it's like, like the last shot of the movie, it's, it's like, is that actually just a follow-up to something that happened an hour ago, and the whole thing has been whatever the hell it's been? any of that, but I don't know that I want to view this movie that way. Me, personally, it's very much a... the viewer... it depends on the viewer thing. It's like, I, I would be interested in hearing a number of theories about this movie and interpretations, but me, personally, I honestly just like it having no explanation, because it makes it so much weirder and disorienting and creepy. To just let it do its thing. I mean, obviously it's the whole, you know, he's having visions or nightmares or whatever. But it's like, I don't even necessarily feel the need to look into any further meaning. It's like, just the moment itself, like the visual, just says, I feel like says everything it needs to say about the points that Eggers wanted to make. And the feel he wanted to have the movie to have. And how he wanted the viewers to feel looking at this shit. <laughs> and... And that's that's really all all I really you know take away from it. But that's more than enough. When you're doing the things that Eggers is doing in this movie, and the two lead actors are doing in this movie, that's all it needs to be a work of art, a work of greatness. And this whole sort of you know just this <laughs> I don't know. It's just a really magnificent piece of horror. And that's. Like I said, just even in the simplest of terms, you can take it as far as its artistry goes, and that's all I need from it, um, is to make me feel the way it does when I'm looking at it without overanalyzing it, or just analyzing it in general. It's, and that's the thing, too, that's the beauty of these movies, and the, way, the reason movies like this that seem weird and off-putting at the time will eventually stand the test of time, because so many pe different people can see it in so many different ways and have s such a different experience with this. And even if you <laughs> go into this movie 
and you're just completely and totally put off by every single frame that you see, that's still quite an experience. You still experience the overall... <laughs> Just, just everything this movie has, whether it be, you know, visual or acting or sound, any of those different aspects of filmmaking, it's all in there in this really spectacular way. And, like I said, even if I take it in the most surface of, you know, outlooks, that's more than enough for a movie like this. It's just... And it, and it will be something... Yeah, it will be a movie I probably go back to again and again and again. And it, when that is the case... I will probably get more interested in, like, you know, the different theories and does this thing mean this thing and, you know, different theories about the last shot and everything. So, yeah, so it's just so much to offer in one less than two hour package. Um, that's that's the best kind of shit. So, <laughs> um, let's go on to, I say that and now all the, the remaining four all break two hours. <laughs> some barely, some extremely. Uh, so... Number four is going to be Uncut Gems. And this is a movie that I did end up seeing twice as well. And it is one that for sure improves because I did think that there was kind of a pacing issue the first time. Uh, and it kind of like, because it's jumping around in so many different places and he's trying to do so many different things at once. Um, but the second time, it feels like a roller coaster ride that is just constant. Um, and I think a lot of people did get that um, the first go around, but it took me a couple of times. And so you've got Sandler in the middle of it, which you look at stuff like Punch Drunk Love, um, and you're like, yeah, Sandler is capable of greatness. He just, when he makes his own, you know, comedies or whatever, maybe they're not the greatest. Um, but he's definitely capable of really great dramatic work and just going in completely different directions than not only what we expect him to, but when you get a sense of, like, his general humble real-life personality and how this character, Howard Ratner, is the absolute opposite of everything Adam Sandler is as a person. Um, where you see, like, Adam Sandler is, like, absolutely rich off of his ass and is, like, as humble as he can possibly be. And Howard Ratner is, like, the most... <laughs> has way, way too much belief in himself and is always pretty much flat broke because, he, I mean, he's living a certain sort of, you know, extravagant lifestyle, but in with the way he lives his life and how he got to this point, this motherfucker is going to be broke, dead broke, any day now <laughs> um, because he's so reckless and unstoppable to both the people around him and himself because this gambling addiction and everything else and this whole digging himself in deeper and deeper into holes is just the life he is going to lead until some sort of breaking point happens whatever that may be and this watching him do this and interact with all the different characters in his life um and the way these scenes are put together also um is so incredibly and even when you're seeing it the second time and you know all the directions it's going to go, it's still just like, it's like somehow you still think maybe he won't make that really terrible decision this time. And he always does because it is in the nature of his character. Like it is just ingrained into this dude. Like probably, it feels like at birth, probably. Um, and watching Sandler go through the events of this movie, whether it be dealing with the very flippant Lakeith Stanfield, or these bodyguards of his brother-in-law that are very overbearing so overbearing that they don't even act like people should in public like they they feel like you know movie characters from a different setting but instead of it instead of them feeling out of place in this setting they feel more threatening in this setting because of that um which is really skillful how they pull that off not just with the actors who to my understanding are inexperienced in acting but also the way the Safety brothers like chose them specifically and how they work that out, um, it just really works wonders. And then um, all these you got you know Judd Hirsch coming in. You've got Eric Bogosian as the guy that seems like he's a crime boss at first, but then it's like it's almost like he's just as desperate as Howard is in a different way. And it's just the way these you know layers are peeled off about all these different characters. And there's so many things going on. 
um, I was explaining the movie to my brother because he didn't quite know what it was about. And it was like, as I, w I would tell him one thing, and I was like, but that's just a subplot. There's also this thing. But that's also just a subplot. There's also this thing. And then by the time I kind of got the whole web worked out, it didn't occur to me until my brother said, holy shit, there's a lot going on in this movie. And it's like, yeah, but it's so well put together and all happening, like, so simultaneously. You don't even, you get so sucked in, you don't even realize how much is going on all at once. <laughs> Um, and it's crazy the roller coaster this movie takes you on with that. And, like I said, with Santa's performance, like, you know, just pulling the whole thing along, um, because, because obviously the believability of everything that happens falls under the believability of Sandler's character, and the fact that he can create this person like this that's just, like, it, like, he's doing so many things that just make you want to throttle him because they're such the wrong decision but the character is so believable that you don't get, like, hung up on that. You just resign to it. You don't say... You don't... Like, in another movie with another character, you might have an audience that says, like, you know, I'm taken out of the movie now because, you know, the characters are too dumb and why would they even do that? But it's like, we have such an understanding of the character at this point just through watching his actions that when he makes another stupid decision, we just... We just have, we just know we we have no choice but to just watch and see what happens now, and if he can get himself out of it, and that's the pull of these scenes in the movie. That's where like the suspense comes in, and that is, it is so incredibly well done. I, and as far as the Safety Brothers go, obviously they are really building a great reputation. They're going to be those directors that like everybody wants to work with, um, and it's like I I wasn't as high on Good Time as most people were. But this one, like, really just kind of hooked me in a way that I kind of wasn't completely expecting. I had high hopes for it, because um, just the concept in general sounded very intriguing, like a great concept to work with this kind of, you know, anxiety-inducing, you know, format that they were going to go for, this style that they have. Um, but wow, this I really like this in a big way, more so uh, than I was even expecting, so... I was really happy to see this uh, live up to that sort of hype. So, number three is another movie that had a, an awful lot of hype to live up to before it even came out. Uh, my number three is Joker. And I get, there there are a lot of different kinds of fans of Joker, <laughs> which makes it even more interesting. Um, and, and I know uh, some people, like, you know, think less of the movie because of maybe stuff that, like, the younger fan base has to say about it or something like that, but... I, don't know, I was trying to think, um, it also uh, just came out on Blu-ray this past Tuesday, and I was watching it again, and trying to figure out exactly what it was, because I knew when I saw it the first time that I absolutely love the last, I, I think in the video I said 15 minutes, the last 15 minutes, but what I was referring to was everything from the stairs scene forward. Um, and the great thing about this movie's pacing and how much it just hooks you and just pulls you into what it does in that mo in those moments, I don't even mean, that's not the last 15 minutes, that's like the last half hour, but it feels so quick, and it's like this chunk of the movie that you just kind of don't want to end. You kind of want to keep seeing, you know, the different places, you know, Arthur and the movie itself are going to go in. Um, and what else is gonna, like, what else are the consequences to all of this? Um, and that, that was astounding to me to learn that that's like, from the stair scene on, it's like the entire last half an hour. That's one-fourth of the movie, and it feels so much quicker than the rest of it. And the rest of it did feel, like, I, I did hear some complaints that some people think that it's a little too, um, slow in cases, like, kind of in the first hour or so. But seeing it again, it was, like, when you know the beats of it, it does feel like it moves a lot faster, where it's like, you know, this is the moment where Arthur meets this point, and, and you can appreciate more, like, the sort of stepping stones it took in Arthur's life that we see to get to where he ends up. Um, and I did mention before that one of the things I was really impressed with was that I initially didn't like the idea, before I saw the movie, of trying to make the Joker sympathetic before he becomes the Joker, because it's like... It just doesn't really feel in line with how we're generally supposed to feel about the character. Um, but it was shocking to me how quickly, in the first scene alone, um, they, like, instantly make him sympathetic and, like, a character that's 
made the way that he is through things that are completely out of his control. Um, and it's, and I thought the way they handled that was, it's, it's also been heavily criticized because some people think that Phyllis was maybe a bit too flippant about, you know, the whole mental illness thing. Um, but I do think it's, it's, it's the gradual nature of the movie. And some scenes may seem redundant. Um, like there may be a lot of scenes of just, you know, Arthur sitting around and laughing or whatever, but it's like, we are watching a descent into madness and somebody going from mentally ill to psychotic and a murderer. But the thing is, is obviously mentally ill is still in there, but still, um, that added thing makes it a whole different scenario. <laughs> um, but the thing here is that that's the whole thing. Like, isn't the whole, uh, definition of insanity, like doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. And it's like, so it's so much like, if the movie does ever start to feel redundant, it almost kind of feels like that's part of the process to get us to that last half hour. Um, and it, it feels like it kind of puts us in there. And the whole thing about making Gotham just sort of feel um, just as dirty and decrepit as possible. Like, people were saying, like, you know, why why is this movie in contention for a makeup and hair Oscar when people are only focusing on the makeup that Joaquin's wearing? But it's like... They, if you look around in the background, it's like everybody in Go and like this is this is a movie set, obviously. So it's like movies are often criticized for like everybody looking like a model uh, when you walk around, but it's like everybody in Gotham looks so fucking homely, whether they're in the foreground or the background, and like that alone really sets the world up a lot. Um, more so in a way that's like in a way that's probably often overlooked. Um, just background stuff like that. But, um, yes, and then, of course, Phoenix's performance, which can maybe seem a bit, you know, mechanical and, you know, ticky and stuff like that, but I, I don't know, if, to me, it's just when we, starting off the way that he does and getting to the point that we do at the end, I can't really find a false note. Um, and it's like, and I totally get those things about performances seeming a bit too mechanical and, like, you can see the actor's wheels turning as it happens, um, but I don't know, there's just something so, there's something about Arthur's character to where when I see that stuff, it still doesn't feel like an actor acting to me. Um, even with, with a, with a, sl even a slightly lesser performance probably would elicit that criticism, but I don't know, I just think it, just, the whole thing pretty much works for me. And the way also, talking about how he's sympathetic, and then eventually by the end he's going to be Joker, is that there are these moments where he's still not quite... I mean, the, the murders happen a lot earlier than I thought they did. The subway murders are like a half an hour in. Um, but there's still something where we can still tell that he's, like, troubled in a way enough that it's like, you know, if, if he could just get help, maybe there could be something. But there's still, like, the line there where, even in scenes when it's not trying to make him overly sinister... Like, it's there as kind of a back and forth between him and just his general sort of mentally ill state. Like, the, the scene when he um, interacts with Bruce on the other side of the gate um, is, like, so chilling and, like, creepy. Uh, but in the kind of the best possible way that that scene sort of is to set that tone, because it's still... We, there, the, the sympathy is still kind of there because it's the whole thing of he thinks Thomas Wayne's his father and he wants to interact with him and... Maybe he can figure out some shit about his life and what his problems are if he can just find a connection like that. Um, and instead, the Bruce scene happens, and it's like, oh, he is really he's going he's getting across that line quick. <laughs> um, and this and I and I think the scene works because of that. So, yeah, so yeah, so all this stuff um, and it's yeah the 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 only problem I had when I initially saw it was I thought the. Uh, the whole reveal about Zazie Beats was a bit, like, obvious. Like, after the, he imagines the talk show scene at the beginning, kind of, I think, sort of, you know, kind of, sh it shows its hand a little too quickly there, and it was kind of easy to figure out there, but, um, but yeah, for the most part, um, I, I really do love it. I was wondering if it was going to go down in quality when I saw it again, but it did not. Um, so I was very happy with that. So, uh, number two is going to be The Irishman. And I know it might seem like a boring choice, and it's like, well, yeah, of course, you know, the giant three-and-a-half-hour Scorsese fashion project's gonna be here, of course. 
Um, but, but no, this isn't one of those cases where, like, this, this, The Irishman has written all over it, this will be a movie where I put it a number two and say, that's more so because I admire it rather than the fact that I enjoy it or anything like that. Um, but that is not the case. Um, The Irishman is very much a movie that I admire, but it's also a movie I can see myself watching many times over, or at least portions of it is more, the more realistic way to probably put that. Um, which is, which is great as far as, like I was saying when I reviewed it, it's like, it's, it, the straight to Netflix thing doesn't, oh, I mean, obviously it was out in theaters for about a month in the big cities before it went to Netflix, but still the idea of, um, stuff going more or less straight to Netflix was, seems like an iffy sort of thing, but it's like, it also feels kind of perfect for that because you can just kind of go to those individual bits and that might seem like there's a lot in the movie that's just dead air or whatever that you want to skip around but it's like no it's just the strength of those scenes like like this there are, I've, I don't remember many dull spots I know there were a lot of complaints that people thought the movie was boring and ever long and all that and at three and a half hours yeah I can I can get somebody saying that even if I didn't feel it myself but yeah, there's, sometimes there's just some stuff that you just have to get back to. And I was saying, there are some moments where Scootmaker's editing is so well done. Like, there's one cut that is so perfect. While I was watching it for the first time, um, I went back and I would watch those cuts again. Because it was like, holy shit. That is, I, like, that is, um, like, nobody but the goddess that is Scootmaker would have thought to do that. Um, and then sometimes there's whole stretches, um, like Hoffa's Fate and the entire, like, 15 to 20 minutes leading into that, starting with Pesci and De Niro having cereal together. Um, and it's, like, that whole segment. And it's, like, that's the thing, is... that's so great about, like, these kinds of gangster movies that would be problems in other movies, and it's often criticized in other movies, is when you go back and you look at, like, The Godfather, or even, you know, Scorsese's other gangster movies, those movies are very episodic. Where, like, it's this one, like, there'll be, like, this one task that needs to be taken care of, or this one thing that goes wrong, and then there's the consequences of it, and then how those are dealt with, and then it kind of goes on to something else, and it's, like, this sort of story-by-story -story thing. But that's what I really love about these movies. It feels like it gives you such a full experience of, like, the life of these people, and then eventually we get to the end, um, when everybody's just old, and like and the and to see like how because Scorsese has been criticized so many times after stuff like Goodfellas of glorifying you know the lives of his criminals in his movies which he absolutely doesn't do we see them go really really they, we see them go down hard in those movies and the thing about it is in this one he does that in an especially triumphant way because it's like in those other movies, like, it's implied that, like, and eventually, you know, this life just sort of gets you nowhere. Like, you just sort of... Go, like, if you don't get killed, you're, your life's just going to be uneventful forever, and that's going to be it. And you'll probably eventually lose everything or whatever. And this one takes, like, an entire portion, like, the last 45 minutes of the movie to just show the aftermath of... They just get old and alone. There's that really powerful moment... That's not over. And so many of the powerful moments in this movie are not overplayed, and I, I'm and I'm afraid a lot of viewers are like gonna miss them because of that. Um, and there's this really powerful moment that just sums up everything, when De Niro is so old and decrepit at the end, and in his wheelchair at this like nursing home, and these guys are talking to him, trying to get information about what happened to Hoffa, and they say he's like you know talk to my lawyers, and they're like your lawyers are dead, dude. And he's like, you know, oh, shit, like, who killed them? And they're like, no, dude, they died of old age. <laughs> and it's like, that's how far distance he is now in his life from what used to be. And it's just, he's alone because everybody's just dead. They just all got old and just kind of drifted off instead of dying in some, you know, dramatic, you know, mob-like fashion or whatever. And that's like the real power of the movie. The whole thing works as this, like, classic, you know, Scorsese gangster. And I get that it doesn't have, like, the pacing and the flashiness and stuff like Goodfellas and Casino and stuff like that. But that's the thing is it's, it's just so more deliberate about itself and more getting that point across of how long the life is and how you just kind of never get out of it until you're just old and decrepit and nobody gives a fuck anymore <laughs> and everybody else is dead. Um, 
and it's like, and that's the thing too, is that that might seem like it's trying to get you to sympathize with these people. Like, to see De Niro just get old and alone in a room. Like, Anna Paquin hates him. You know, Pesci has gone off to the hospital and died somewhere. Uh, <laughs> and all these people, his lawyers are dying of old age, all that stuff. But it's like, it's not necessarily just, like, you don't have to sympathize for the De Niro character to feel that on a human level. That's just in general. Like, all humans, regardless of the life we lead, are going to get to that point to where if we don't die sooner, we're just going to get old and everybody's going to die around us and we're going to be alone. And it's like, just on a human level, that hits in a way. So, I think that, so that it works on so many levels like that and actually takes the time to go in that direction to where they said, we could cut this down, we could liven it up a little bit, but no, fuck you, we're going to deliberately pace it and make it three and a half hours and see it all the way through to the end. And that's, like I said, and, and, you know, props to Netflix for, like, actually giving them the funding to do that and saying, you know, you know, make it three and a half hours, you know, we don't care. <laughs> it's like, you're Scorsese, do what the fuck you want to do. And you've got this cast, the star power, that somehow doesn't take away from all this. Like, you'd think it would be distracting where it's like, oh, De Niro, Pacino, Pesci, Harvey Keitel, all these people, and all the people that come in and out, too. So many recognizable faces. And it's like, especially in this genre. And you'd think that'd be distracting, but it's like they're so lived in in their characters already. That Kaitel scene especially, when he talks about, um, when he basically hit the wrong person, and he's like, you know, I own the other half of that. That, that, whole, that whole dialogue is like, all funny, while at the same time extremely threatening. Um, and it's just, the moments like that are just through and through throughout the movie. And it's like, whether it's, you know, a Hoffa scene, or whether it's an assassination scene, or whether it's a Pesci scene, whether it's downplayed, whether it's violent, whether it's a, you know, Pacino gets the shout scene, they all hit in their own particular way, and the movie is just all of that, like, just one after the other, for three and a half straight hours. And like I said, all the human elements of getting old and dying and dealing with that, no matter what life you led, whether you're a criminal or not, and just the whole emotional level of it just sort of reaches this peak in the last 45 minutes and just sends us out on this really sort of melancholy note. And I was thinking about this movie because, you know, seeing multiple movies every week, you tend to, even the ones you really like, you tend to just kind of push out after a while because so much is coming down the line. I thought about this movie for so fucking long after I saw it. Um, and it just really stuck with me in this really big way. And it was everything I could have hoped it would be. You notice I haven't mentioned the CGI yet? That's because there's so many magnificent elements in this movie. It's the last thing I even think to mention. Yeah, the, the CGI sometimes is unconvincing, uh, and sometimes the way they move, you can tell how old they are. But I mean, that is just so... It just feels so insignificant after a while. Unle unless it's really, really obvious in the few cases that it is. Um, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> It's, there's way too much working in this movie to care about that uh, as much as some people do. So that's how I feel about that. So let's go on to number one, which won't surprise anybody. There's no surprise. I, I even I wore this shirt intentionally because I knew there was no surprise element <laughs> to what number one is. Uh, obviously, my number one is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, and what can I even say about this masterpiece that I haven't already? I, uh, I said when, uh, in 2015 we were doing this, and I was trying to decide between The Hateful Eight and The Revenant, and it was like, of course I'm going to go for the Scorsese movie. Um, this is like, or the no, Scorsese movie, the Tarantino movie, um, but it's like, here's the thing, is when I was choosing between, like, is The Hateful Eight the best movie 2015 or is The Revenant, it's like, yeah, of course I'm going to go for the Tarantino movie. Um, I talked about everything I loved about The Irishman just now. And I do love The Irishman that much. And I love all the movies on this list that much. This is number one in a fucking landslide. It is, like, not even close. This is... And this may seem like recency bias, but I think I've seen the movie enough times now that I feel very confident in saying this is my favorite movie of the decade. I know it was at the very end of it. Um, because, and the thing about that is because my favorite movie of the decade before this was Django Unchained. Go figure. <laughs> and it's like... I do think this might be Tarantino's second best movie after Pulp Fiction, which is my favorite movie of all time. So, <laughs> so if that doesn't say it enough, um, 
this is just, I really love this double-sided slipcover. That was like the best possible idea to do with this. This is the one that also came with uh, the postcards that are the posters for Rick Dalton's movies, uh, which I love. Um, so yeah, what can I even say that I haven't already? Um, it's just scene after scene after scene after scene after scene for, what is it, two hours and 41 minutes, and it's like, Every scene in this movie is a new classic Tarantino scene, I feel. Even the most downplayed stuff. This is like, this is easily the most relaxing Tarantino movie that, he, that he's ever made. Uh, just those scenes, some of the stuff that people criticize, like the scenes of Brad Pitt driving around. As I said before, I love the scenes that are just Brad Pitt driving around. That scene when he's just go, when we just watch him go from Rick's house to just home to hang out with Brandy and eat macaroni and cheese and watch TV. And it's like, that's just the greatest thing ever. That is just so, like, you watch this and you're like, in the moment, you're like, I just fucking wish I was Cliff Booth. Like, that that seems like such an easygoing life. Like, you, you, you hang out with your buddy, you look to see if you can find work, and you just, you just go home to your dog. And that's your life. Uh, <laughs> and it's, you drive around in his car, you do all that stuff, and you take in all this stuff. Then, like, recreating... L.A. to look like 1969, like, in its entirety, and the way they show that stuff off, where it's like, you can have scenes where you just sort of linger on the scenery and say, hey, look what, you know, our set dressers did, look what our production design team did, aren't we amazing? But no, they do stuff like the, um, the out-of-time montage, where they're playing the Rolling Stones song, and it's when they're coming back from Italy, and the sun's going down, and we're just watching all the lights come on, and it's, it's amazing, it's, it's like, I love the way they use the setting in this, like, that's, that's the whole thing, it's, that's the great thing about the scenes where nothing's happening as far as the characters are concerned, is because the settings just speak for themselves that much, <laughs> um, it, it's crazy, and then there's just stuff like, when, like, you feel like there's so much that happens, you feel like you've been through an entire day with both Rick and Cliff in the whole middle section of the movie, the second day of the movie, um, when we're going back and forth between, um, Rick being on the set of Lancer, which is one of the best scenes Tarantino's ever done. Like, it makes me, the Lancer scene made me so relieved, because it was like, and, and the Bounty Law scenes too, because it's like, Tarantino, Tarantino keeps going on about this thing about how I'm gonna make one more movie and then I'm gonna retire, and it's like, I'll write books, I'll write plays, I'll write, you know, TV stuff, do stuff like that, and it was like, yeah, but I'm like I'm like a movie guy, and losing Tarantino in the movie world is like I don't know. But then it's like I see this, and it's like if he's gonna like if he's gonna go into the world of TV after movies, and he's gonna write stuff like the way he wrote that episode of Lancer, or the way he was writing for Bounty Law, it's like holy shit, no, we're not gonna lose anything. He'll still be right there if it's stuff like this, if it's still this quality. Um, that's great. I mean, obviously, we'll always long for him to be in the movie world, and there's still a piece of I think all of us that's hoping. That's not going to be the case. Like, he loves making movies too much. That Will he or will he not commit to that? But even if he does go into the other one, this, is, this movie and the stuff in it made me confident in... Uh, okay, yeah, if, even if he does stuff outside of movies, he's still absolutely going to be there, which is very comforting. <laughs> um, so that's great. Um, but yeah, uh, what, what was I going on about? Yeah, um, oh, the stuff I completely sidetracked myself, um, where it feels like we spend a whole day on the Lancer set, um, with him, and then there's the whole thing at Spawn Ranch, um, with Cliff, and interacting with all them, and then going in to make sure George is still there, um, and then beating the shit out of Clem, uh, and it's like, and, it, and that thing where it's the long drawn-out sequences that end in fireworks, and it's like, that Spawn Ranch scene, I looked, I looked on the timer on the fucking Blu-ray player, Cliff, there's no break in between, there's no cut to another scene. Cliff arriving with Pussycat on Spawn Ranch and pulling up, and then him driving away after Tex just missed him after he beats the shit out of Clem, is 20 minutes. That is a 20 minute scene. And you do not feel that time whatsoever. This is why Tarantino gets any length he fucking wants. I really want that fucking four-hour cut that he apparently started with. And I hear he, I heard he's doing the miniseries thing on um, Netflix for this, the way he did with The Hateful Eight, which is really exciting. One thing that's disappointing is this movie does have deleted scenes on it. It's got like 25 minutes worth of deleted scenes. But there's still stuff that's not here. The Tim Roth scene is still nowhere to be found. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing just about 
anything else that happens to be missing from this movie. But as a whole, as it is right now, is like absolutely perfect. Like it's like it's. I almost struggle to want those extra scenes added and see what they are because it's like the movie is perfect the way it is. It really is. And I'm sure you know a four hour cut would have been perfect also. But it's like I guess because I'm so like. It's, I'm so familiar with it now, and it's like, you know, every time you visit it, it's like visiting an old friend already. Um, it's like you feel like, like when the scene where Rick and Cliff are watching FBI, which is also, I want to say one of the best scenes in the movie, but like every fucking scene is one of the best scenes in the movie. But it's like when Rick and Cliff, the way they watch FBI together and commentate, that'll be how people watch this movie. And, then, and, I, and I love, I just love the feeling of that, where it just feels like, like, yeah, like, you can just hang out with this movie at any given time, because it just feels, I said, it's just so relaxing to that. And after you spend the day with them, you know, whether it be on Spawn Ranch or on the Lancer set, there's that amazing scene. Or with um, Sharon at the theater, who just hung out, hung out and watched The Wrecking Crew all day, <laughs> uh, which is great. I, like, I'm assuming we're, we're supposed to assume she watched, like, all the showtimes. And then she comes out, and, you know... Uh, Cliff's coming back from Spawn Ranch, Rick's coming out of the set, out of the lot, um, and the sun is going down, and the sun is setting on this day finally, and it feels like a day has passed. It feels like you spent a whole day with these people, and now it's just time to go fucking home and watch FBI, and there's this great sequence where they're playing this, like, that version of California Dream, and it's so perfect for this moment, and we're just watching everybody go home. We're watching James Stacy get on his bike and go off. We are, uh, I, I like the little detail of that too, where it's like, there's something kind of melancholy in that shot of Stacy driving off on the bike because Jim Stacy eventually got into a wreck on that bike and lost a leg, I think. So it's like, it's, it's sort of like a call to that, but like in the meantime, right now, just for today, everybody's just going home and this day's just going to end peacefully after all the eventful shit that happened. <laughs> um, and it just takes moments like that um, that are just so just so perfect, and the fact, just watch, like I said, watching the people drive, not just Cliff, but like, Polanski driving to the Playboy Mansion, is like one of my favorite segments also, because it's like, for some reason, everybody drives in this movie, uh, like they're ready to fucking die, <laughs> and it's great, just watching Polanski and Sharon Tate speed off to the Playboy Mansion, it's like, you can, it's like you can smell the L.A. air, and I've never even been to L.A., and it's like, but you can still, let alone in L.A. in 1969, like, 21 years before I was even on Earth. Uh, <laughs> and, it's, and it's just so, yeah, if I go on any further, we're probably going to be here all day, so I should probably just end this, but surely my point has been made. Um, I seriously cannot get enough of this movie, and it's one of those things where, like, even if I don't intend on watching it all the way through, I'll probably just, in many cases, like, if I'm trying to write or something, or just whatever, or deal with other shit, it'll just be there in the background. It's like, this this thing is gonna fucking live in the Blu-ray player, probably, <laughs> so, um, I, yeah, so I think that should get my point across enough, uh, and so that's what this year brought, um, next year has a lot to live up to, but we'll see what happens, so, until this gets dragged out any further, I think we'll just say, uh, that's it.